morning. Very enthusiastic group. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. That's a little better. There's coffee up here. If anyone would like some hot coffee before we get started. Um, we're here for our uh, seminar for Dr. Tammy Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is here from Fort Collins, Colorado, and interviewing for our Uvalde uh, research position, our wildlife disease ecology position. Uh, she's currently with uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Uh, she's an O-RISE research fellow and has been with, uh, with the CDC for the last four and a half years. Uh, she received a, a bachelor's from North Dakota, a master's from Kansas State, and a PhD from the University of Montana and NIH. And so she's uh, gonna tell us a little bit about uh, some of her work in more recent years. And uh, with that, I'll let Tammy come up here and, and give her a research seminar. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the search committee for inviting me. Um, it's definitely a lot more humid here than it is in Colorado right now. I don't think I've stopped sweating since I got here yesterday. Um, but yeah, so today I just would like to, oops, helps if I go the right way. Um, so I'll start with uh, talking about my past research. Um, I'll focus a, a good amount of the talk on my current research in Minnesota. Um, and then I'll follow up with areas of research interest to me here in Texas. And my kind of overall vision for uh, what I'd like to do, um, help to, uh, provide or contribute to the wildlife disease program in Uvalde. So um, I would consider myself a vector-borne disease ecologist. And as a vector ecologist, um, I really try to use integrated approaches to understand where on the landscape pathogens and vectors exist, why pathogens and vectors exist where they do, um, how they get there, and how they become established. Um, and how climate change may affect um, pathogen and vector distributions as well. And um, to do this, I use um, many different tools, including GIS and spatial models, um, as well as inter interdisciplinary collaborations to help answer these kind of broad scale questions. Um, so my interest in disease, um, diseases, wildlife diseases uh, in particular, started um, during my first technician job, I was um, tasked with monitoring blacktail prairie dog um, populations and looking at colony complexes and the spread of, of the, the growth of the colonies. And then all of a sudden, all of my prairie dogs died and I became very interested in um, um, sylvatic plague and I was just amazed at how, how quickly this pathogen could come through and just knock out an ent it colonies, entire complexes in a matter of weeks. So that was really what started my interest, which led to my master's thesis, um, the spatial dynamics of a bacterial pathogen, um, sylvatic plague and black-tail prairie dogs. And most of my research um, for my master's thesis focused on kind of the spatial distribution of colonies, attributes of, of colonies that made them more or less susceptible to um, to being wiped out by plague, uh, and kind of just how, how, how plague affects um, the populations in general. So moving from here, um, I decided if I really wanted to be a disease ecologist that I should go get my PhD. And so I was fortunate to receive a, NI, or a NSF IGERT fellowship to uh, attend the University of Montana, um, the Montana Ecology of Infectious Diseases program specifically. And um, then I ended up getting hooked up with Tom Schwann at the NIH laboratory in Hamilton and um, studied uh, tick-borne relapsing fever in the Flathead Valley and was very fortunate to be able to work at Rocky Mountain Lab, which is a historical lab. Um, it's where Dr. Ricketts discovered what was happening with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, they built the original lab building, which you can see in the bottom right of the screen. Um, and my office was actually housed in that building, and it still has the original tick moat that the community made them build around the house so that around the lab so the ticks wouldn't escape. So it's on the historical registry, and it still has the tick moat. Uh, there is no water in the tick moat, but, um, and it's about that deep, so, and about that wide. I don't know how effective it was, but, or if it had to be. So um, I conducted most of my research on um, Wild Horse Island, which was prompted by a um, outbreak of tick-borne relapsing fever um, that happened a few years before we started research there. 
Um, and so Wild Horse Island is actually a state park, so there's no camping allowed. However, um, if you can see all the dots um, around the shore on the right hand, um, bottom right of the screen, those are all private residences. So those are private cabins and um, each, well, not all of them have a cabin on, on them. Some of them just have a tent slab, um, but they're all one acre privately owned properties and that's the only place you can stay the night on, on the island. Um, but it's a great place to work. True to its name, there's wild horses, there's big mule deer population, and some of the biggest bighorn sheep uh, in North America actually. Um, and the island is devoid of chipmunks. And so we've worked on a couple of different islands um, which had very different species um, compositions. And so we looked at host associations and genomic diversity. We amassed the largest collection of um, tick-borne relapsing fever isolates um, in North America, mostly from pine squirrels or red squirrels um, and actually quite a few from ticks that we were able to collect. So it's very hard to collect soft ticks, but we had some, some pretty good luck. Um, <clears throat> we also um, teamed up with a group from California and combined our data sets and I um, did a ran a MaxNet model, um, a species distribution model um, or habitat suitability model um, for the tick and uh, we also wanted to look at what happens in the future or what's predicted to happen with future climate change, how the distribution of these soft ticks might change. Um, and so the current distribution or predicted distribution is shown on the gray and unlike a lot of other vector vector species, um, this, their distribution is, is um, predicted to actually condense um, in the face of climate change, whether there are a lot of other vectors, their breeding seasons are, are increased and so their populations really can spread geographically. However, not the case here, they're forced up to these more um, high, high mountainous regions. Uh, we also had some other interesting findings. Um, we collected uh, identical strains um, of Borrelia hermesii from a spotted owl that was found dead in um, Washington several years um, earlier, and then it matched a, um, a strain from a um, American red squirrel um, caught in Montana. And then, um, as part of the IGERT program, one of our um, one of the um, one of the requirements of the program was we got to um, actually collaborate with um, somebody that was out of our discipline. And so I collaborated with uh, Dr. Aaron Langdeth and we um, came up with an SIR model that included a re uh, relapsing component, um, which had really never been done before. Um, so we were able to show that um, there, there needs to be about four relapses for squirrels and then if you actually add an incompetent host, it actually increases the number of relapses that are, that are necessary to keep R0 above one. Um, so after um, I graduated from Montana, I uh, received an American Society for Microbiology um, postdoc fellowship to join the plague lab with Ken Gage and, and Becky Eisen at CDC. And um, it, was, it was kind of a neat experience because I got to um, take my experience from the field and what I knew about plague and, and bring that into the laboratory and actually look at the early phase dynamics um, that happened within the, in the flea. Um, that actually lead to the epizootic spread of plague in prairie dogs. So we did a lot of um, lab work with uh, obviously a tier one select agent um, and, and showed that early phase transmission, um, you really don't need um, mid-gut colonization. So um, following this, our lab, uh, Joe Peisman retired from the CDC and um, the focus of our lab was sw switched and so we became the Vector Surveillance and Disease Ecology Lab. And so the main um, point of our lab is to determine when and where people are at most risk for encountering vector-borne pathogens. And to better understand how these disease um, agents are maintained in nature, um, using this information to um, improve prevention and control strategies. And we focus primarily on black-legged ticks in our lab, um, or Xodes scapularis, or the deer tick, whichever you would like to refer to it as. Um, but it, but being at CDC has also provided me the opportunity to work on um, some other systems and um, other um, divisions within, or branches I should say, within the CDC. Um, so I was involved with modeling um, the environmental um, suitability for um, the two species of 80s um, mosquito vectors that can vector Zika virus. Um, I was also um, involved in some um, tick work in the national parks uh, in the eastern United States. Um, so a lot of the battlefields um, as well as you know some forested, more forested parks. 
um, also involved with um, some residential versus recreational risk assessments in, in Minnesota for um, Lyme disease especially, um, but other exodia scapularis born diseases as well. Um, and then also um, helped with um, a lot of GIS um, analysis for um, a, a project looking at um, the, the Pacificus ticks um, in California, which also transmit Lyme disease there. So tick-borne diseases, I'll talk about my current research um, at this point. So in general, tick-borne diseases, um, especially Lyme disease, have been increasing in both number and geographic extent um, for the last 20 plus years. Um, actually, since they were discovered, they've just always kept increasing. Um, so you'll notice too, I wonder if this will work. Uh -huh. um, so there's two main foci of Lyme disease in the United States. Um, one in the upper Midwest, one in the north, um, eastern and mid-Atlantic mid states. And these maps are showing um, one dot per case uh, placed randomly in the county of residence. So if we look at 1998 versus 2015, we see a pretty dramatic increase um, at both of these foci. Um, both of these foci. And we also see um, similar patterns if we look at other um, tick-borne diseases, not necessarily only those ones transmitted by Ixodes scapularis. Um, so the spotted gr fever group rickettsi rickettsiosis um, bugs are, are really increasing recently, and that has a lot to do with uh, um, the brown dog ticks um, being responsible for transmitting um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever in um, Arizona and New Mexico. So as you can see, um, these problems just keep, keep increasing year after year. Um, if we look at Minnesota, which was the focus of all of my research, uh, Minnesota is on the western leading edge of the distribution, and Minnesota, counties within Minnesota have really, um, have increased five-folds. Um, counties with established populations of Ixodes scapularis have increased five-folds um, between 1995 and 2015. So now we have almost this continuous distribution of Ixodes scapularis throughout the, um, the Northeast, and then we almost have um, the Midwestern focus um, connected to um, the Mid-Atlantic focus um, at, at this point. If we continue to look specifically at Minnesota, um, the pattern of uh, Ixodes scapularis distribution and the distribution of cases of um, Lyme disease and the plasmosis and babesiosis, which are the three most common tick-borne diseases in Minnesota, um, we see a, a, a very nice correlation um, with the distribution of reported cases and the known distribution of the ticks. Um, and in Minnesota, tick-borne diseases caused by Ixodes scapularis have increased 742% between 1996 and 2011. Um, additionally, there has been um, the description of two new human-associated um, pathogens transmitted by Ixodes scapularis, and these seem to be restricted to Minnesota and Wisconsin. So in Minnesota, um, the Ixodes scapularis has about a three-year life cycle. Uh, it's a two-year life cycle in other, uh, other parts of its distribution. And we're really interested in this kind of shaded part, um, which is the nymphal life stage of the tick. And we're interested in the nymphal life stage because they're really responsible for transmitting the most um, diseases to humans because of their small size. They're about the size of a poppy seed, and they're really, if they're not attached, they're really hard to see. And if they are attached, they're, they're hard to feel. And um, so they really, they remain undetected long enough and attached to transmit some of these diseases, which Powassan can be transmitted in 15 minutes. So, um, you know, for Lyme disease, it's, you know, if you get them off in, within 48 hours, you're good, but um, other things can be transmitted much more quickly. So in Minnesota, um, Xodes scapularis vectors seven pathogens, um, in addition to Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, which is a causative agent of Lyme disease. Um, we also have Borrelia maonii, um, which is, um, also causes Lyme disease, and Ehrlichia miris oclarensis, which are the two pathogens that are restricted to the upper Midwest. Um, they're also capable of transmitting Borrelia miomotoi, Anaplasma ficus tophilum, Babesia microti, and we also um, tested for Powassan virus, specifically lineage 2 or the deer tick virus. 
So um, back to the mission of our lab, essentially, when and where are people at highest risk of encountering these ticks and their associated pathogens? Um, we really set out with four different projects in order to um, get a better handle on this. We modeled the distribution of suitable um, habitat using presence data provided by the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, we then used this model to um, <clears throat> guide sampling efforts to better determine where um, humans are at greatest risk for exposure to ticks. Um, we set up a phenology study to determine when humans are at greatest risk. And then um, to get a better handle on enzootic maintenance, we looked at hosts. Um, uh, small mammal hosts that had immature ticks um, and we're testing those for pathogens. Um, so I'll really just focus on these second two. Um, but as I mentioned, we did do a habitat suitability um, or distribution model for the state of Minnesota. Um, and so this is the results. The predicted suitable habitat is shown in the red on the left hand side of the screen. And just for comparison, so you can see what's really driving this model, not surprisingly, it's um, forest cover. Um, specifically cool temperate forests, um, but also to a lesser extent uh, lowland and montane um, boreal forests. So you can see that the distribution really kind of mirrors this uh, green section, um, but the other forest types are, are playing more of a, more of a role in, in northern Minnesota. So um, we used that model um, and we wanted to, we set out to quantify the density of NIMPS, nymphal infection prevalence and co-infections in NIMPS um, and uh, with the ultimate goal of developing an acrological risk model um, describing the density of ticks across the state of Minnesota. And so as I mentioned, we used that MaxSent model to get to guided sampling and we Developed a, a or developed and implemented a stratified random sampling scheme. We selected 81 sites across the state of Minnesota that were sampled twice in June of 2015, um, and then I um, used a zero-inflated negative binomial modeling framework in order to develop the density, um, the density or risk surface for Minnesota. So, um, just some quick results. Um, our study sites are all shown in um, the right-hand side of the map. Sites where we collected nymphs are shown in black. Sites where no nymphs were collected are shown in white. Um, and then the metropolitan Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, metropolitan counties are shaded. Um, we collected nymphs successfully from 64 of 81 sites. Um, and density ranged from 0.13 to 10.67 nymphs per 100 square meters. And density was best described by the um, amount of agricultural land. So um, the zero inflated negative binomial model can be kind of thought of as a hurdle model in a sense where you have two parts. The first part predicts presence or absence. Um, in this case, um, the zero inflated is predicting the presence of a zero. So the presence of no ticks being found. And we see that agricultural land um, was the only variable that was found to be significant. And it had a very um, strong positive impact on finding no ticks. So the more ag land you had, the less likely that you found a tick in general. The second portion of the model, um, the negative binomial, is actually the count portion. So this is how many ticks you would expect. Um, and not surprisingly, agricultural has a negative effect um, on this portion of the model. So the more ag land you have, the less ticks you should find. Um, and then also uh, a few other um, climate variables, as well as elevation, had um, to a lesser extent were important in the model. So if we look at the, um, the distribution um, predicted by um, the zero inflated negative binomial model, um, I'm showing observed densities in the dots on the map, and then the predicted density from the model is given um, by the shading underneath. So wherever you have a dot that's laying on top of the same color of shading, that means they're observed and predicted um, were, were equal. Um, if you have a, a hot dot on a cool background, we observe more than you would expect, and then vice versa, wherever we have a hot or a, a cool dot on a hot on a hot background. So we observe fewer ticks than the model predicted here. Um, you'll notice there's a couple of areas um, at with elevated risk um, in the north northern portion of the state, and then as well around the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Um, and we also tested. Um, basically how our model was doing, or the confidence we have in our model across the state um, by calculating standard deviation. And given the negative binomial um, 
structure to the data, you would expect um, that areas with a high high predicted or high predicted mean would also have a higher standard deviation because those two values are expected to increase um, with one another. So density also um, followed acrological and epidemiological data. Um, so I calculated the percent of risk um, contained within each county in Minnesota and then compared that to the county classification um, either with populations of ticks or the um, risk classification um, as computed by the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, so here we're showing um, counties with no records, reported records, and established populations. Um, and we see that um, counties with established populations do in fact have significantly more area classified as risk as those counties with no records. Um, <clears throat> and if we look at um, the risk classification again by the Minnesota Department of Health, um, high and medium risk counties both contain more um, percent area risk than um, low and high counties actually contain more risk than moderate counties. So just um, a few conclusions from the density model. Um, land cover or specifically the lack of agriculture was the most influential um, variable in the model along with a few other um, climate variables as well as de um, elevation. Our model had very high sensitivity, in fact 100%, um, but a low specificity. Um, so our 100% sensitivity comes from every site where we collected a tick. Um, the model predicted that we should collect ticks. And then the low specificity, in my mind, isn't such a big deal. Um, so 11 out of 17 sites where we didn't find ticks, the model predicted that we should, however, or should find at least one tick. Um, however, these areas really could represent areas of low density that um, the density was below our level of detection, which was one tick per 750 square meters. Um, or they could represent areas for future population expansion within the state. Oops. Um, again, you can see from the map that there's a lot of uh, sub-county level heterogeneity. Um, and areas in Minnesota, northern Minnesota may call for additional um, um, surveillance because they're, they're really representing recreational um, areas in the state. And then Minneapolis-St. Paul, because it has such a big or a high population density, um, maybe we could we call for increased vigilance um, to residents of the, of the metropolitan area. So taking this one step further and now testing all of those ticks to see what they're all infected with. Um, so we tested 1,240 nymphs for seven pathogens. Um, and we calculated the nymphal infection prevalence for 64 sites where nymphs were collected using ma maximum likelihood estimates. And we also determined significant spatial clustering um, using, um, of, of nymphal infection pre pre prevalence uh, using SATSCAN. And this paper is currently in review. So overall, 30% of nymphs in Minnesota were infected with at least, or with something, um, with at least one pathogen. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, sensu stricto, the causative agent of Lyme disease, um, not surprisingly, was the most, most prevalent. So just over 25% of all ticks tested, um, tested positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. Anaplasma phagocytophilum and Babesia microti, um, again, following the epidemiological data for the state, they were, in fact, the, the two, second two most common um, in, in line after um, Lyme disease spirochetes. And then uh, Ehrlichia meris oclorensis, um, Miyamotoi, Maonii, and Powassan virus are, are found at much, much lower um, numbers in the state. So, I mean, we get down to, um, you know, less than a percent of, of all ticks tested. So um, the next two slides are going to be exactly the same setup. So I just wanted to kind of describe because it's a very busy, um, busy map, but I'm showing each one of the three um, pathogens that we're interested in. The nymphal infection prevalence is shown by the black dots. The gray halos are the width of the 95% confidence interval, so how much confidence or how, how much faith do we have in that, in that estimate. Um, and then the significant spatial clustering is shown by the solid and dashed circles. Um, so for Borrelia burgdorferi, again, you can see um, this pathogen is pretty much spread throughout the state. Um, but this cluster up here are significantly 
um, higher than expected prevalence compared to um, surrounding sites. Um, and similarly, um, the, this cluster of um, study sites has a lower than expected nymphal infre infection prevalence as compared to neighboring sites. We see um, much the same pattern with anaplasma and babesia um, in that uh, we again get high clustering of high um, prevalent sites in the northwestern portion of our study area and lower than expected clusters in the southern portion. And again, for babesia, the, the same pattern. If we look at the four least common pathogens, the only one where we saw um, spatial patterns, um, significant spatial patterns was actually Powassan virus or deer tick virus. Um, but again, it's still in the center, kind of in the center of the state. And then if we look at the other pathogens, even though we didn't see significant spatial clustering, you can see that the distribution really um, is very similar to the three most common pathogens. And Ehrlichia miris oclarensis was the only other pathogen found in addition to um, Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto at our northernmost study site in, um, in Voyagers National Park. If we look at co-infections, 7% of all NIMS that we tested were co-infected with um, at least or greater than one pathogen. Not surprisingly, the majority of co-infections um, were made up of um, Borrelia burgdorferi, anaplasma, and babesia. Um, so just over 2% of ticks were co-infected um, with um, Burgdorferi and Anaplasma. 1.69% um, of ticks were infected with Borrelia and Babesia. And then a triple infection with those three pathogens um, was found in about 1.5% of ticks. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of this table. Um, and we had three ticks that were co-infected with four pathogens, which is just gross if you ask me. Um, but they were all three co-infected with Borrelia, um, Burgdorferi, Anaplasma, and Babesia. And then the fourth pathogen was different um, for all three of them. So one was also infected with Ehrlichia miris oclarensis. One was also infected with Borrelia miyamotoi. And then one with Borrelia maonii. Um, so if we look at co-infections kind of in a, in a different way, because if we look at all of all ticks tested, um, the, the percentages seem pretty low. However, if we look at um, the number of positive ticks for each um, pathogen tested, and then of those, how many were co-infected with something else, um, you'll see that for all of the other pathogens except for Dorferi and Powassan, the percentage of ticks that were infected with that pathogen were also infected with um, other pathogens. So um, greater than like 75% of all ticks infected with these pathogens were co-infected as well. So um, conclusions from um, this portion of the study, um, Burgdorferi, um, Anaplasma, and my, um, Babesia were the three most common and widespread pathogens. They all shared um, a very similar geographic distribution. And although we found all seven different pathogens, the risk to Lyme disease is really the only thing, um, the only, it poses the greatest risk uh, across the state and exposure to those other pathogens is actually relatively low. Um, the distribution of pathogens um, really matches closely to the um, case data in, in the state. Um, and this research has provided more, um, more detail on the distribution and abundance of rare pathogens. So for example, Borrelia maonii prior to this study had only been reported from three counties. It's now reported from nine counties in Minnesota. Um, and again, co-infections with the three most common pathogens were most common. So looking at when um, people are at greatest risk, we've worked closely with the Minnesota Department of Health um, who have done most of the sampling, or actually all of the sampling um, with, with some help um, from other colleagues from um, county health departments and such. And so we've chosen four study sites located across uh, Minnesota, Itasca State Park, St. Croix State Park, William O'Brien State Park, and a site in Houston County. And we've monitored these sites by sampling the same 750 meter transect with replacement bi-weekly um, from April to April of 2015 to November of 2017. Of course, not sampling when there's snow on the ground, which is November to March usually in, in Minnesota. <laughs> Um, so I'm just showing the results for the nymphs, and um, each of these panels, um, so each of the groups in these panels has the same um, scale, so 0 to 20 nymphs um, for Itasca. 
Um, but each panel has a different scale. So St. Croix has zero to 50 nymphs. William O'Brien is zero to 60. And Houston County is zero to four. Um, and again, each year, and all, um, all X axes are the same um, on this slide. Um, so what we can see is that in Minnesota, nymphs definitely seem to be active over the same time period um, each year. However, the amplitude of this activity really um, can change a lot um, within sites as well as between sites within the same year. Um, so for example, in 2017, we caught um, that the greatest for a single sampling session at Itasca was five nymphs. Um, whereas at St. Croix St. State Park um, in 2017, the greatest sampling um, was around 50 nymphs. So there's a lot of variation between sites and between years as well. So um, <clears throat> all life stages of ex Exodi scapularis are host seeking simultaneously. Um, adults are active from about April to November, and I didn't show you this data, but they really kind of have a bimodal distribution where they're more, more uh, abundant in April and May, and then again in um, the late, late summer. Um, nymphs are, are actively host-seeking from May till August, but they have their biggest peak between June and July. Um, there's high intersite and interannual variation um, in nymphal abundance, and larval and nymphal ticks are actually questing at the same time um, in Minnesota, which um, is completely different from what happens um, in the, the northeastern U.S. where um, nymphs quest early in the summer and then larvae don't quest until later in the summer, so they don't have an overlapping, um, they don't have any overlapping questing time. Um, and even though drag sampling isn't the best, we were able to get quite a few larvae collected on our drags, um, but we wanted to take this one step further and look at small mammals um, because because you're more likely to find larval ticks and a better estimation of the amount or density of larval ticks um, by collecting small mammals. Um, so we set out to identify um, enzootic maintenance hosts for immature ticks as well as pathogens um, in order to inform host targeted intervention. So if chipmunks are playing a bigger role than mice and you're trying to target mice, maybe you're missing your target species. Um, and then also we wanted to know um, how host infestation and infection um, affects the, um, the questing nymphs in, in the following year. Um, so if we quantify infestation and infection in 2016, we wanted to go back in 2017 and sample the questing nymphs and see um, if there are correlations between um, host infestation and infection. So um, we conducted small mammal surveys at um, five sites. Um, some of them will be familiar because they're also um, phenology sites, but our northernmost site was Chippewa National Forest, and then again, Itasca, Camp Ripley, which is a military inst installation, um, St. Croix State Park and William O'Brien State Park. And I um, live trapped these animals, collected all ticks off of them, um, as well as a tissue sample and a blood sample for culture and PCR and then um, release the animals after they recovered. Um, and then we also conducted drag sampling um, in 2017 in order to answer the questions that I just posed. So I don't have um, results really for this, um, so I'm still awaiting all of the PCR results um, from the blood and tissue samples. But because we started cultures in the field, um, I do have some preliminary culture results. Um, so we were able to confirm infection with Borrelia meonii, which is that newly described pathogen, in two American red squirrels, um, both from Chippewa National Forest and then um, from four white-footed mice um, from St. Croix State Park. And um, one of these two squirrels was actually co-infected with Borrelia burgdorferi as well. Um, so this was the first isolation of Borrelia meonii from a natural host. Um, and we were also able to um, get an isolate of Borrelia miyamotoi um, from a chipmunk, an eastern chipmunk, also captured from, um, Saint, or excuse me, Chippewa National Forest. So um, just in summary for this part, um, the distribution of exotic scapularis is highly dependent on forested habitat. Um, and is also affected by climate conditions. There is synchronous questing of all three life stages. Um, most importantly, nymphs and, and larvae are questing at the same time. 30% of all nymphs are infected with something. 25% um, of those are infected with um, Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, density of nymphs, nymphal infection prevalence, and um, 
density of infected nymphs uh, varies significantly across uh, Minnesota, but it does seem to um, mirror the human case data and um, has provided information on non-notifiable diseases. Um, so not all of these tick-borne diseases are notifiable. Um, <clears throat> and also has provided information on, I think, recreational risk, because that area in kind of northwestern Minnesota is really, it's called Lake Country, and Minnesotans have have cabins up there that they go to every year. They visit the same resort year after year. They make the reservation for the next year before they leave you know, that year. Um, so there's a lot of recreational um, possibility for exposure in this area. Um, and then um, Borrelia burgdorferi and Maonii seem to uh, share the same small mammal reservoirs, which could have implications for distribution of this novel pathogen. Oops. Um, so I would just like to stop here and thank um, everybody that's been involved in, in this project in, in Minnesota, um, especially um, members from the Bacterial Diseases Branch, uh, which is the branch that I work in, so Becky Eisen and Ken Gage. Um, and then um, also we had lots of ticks tested by the Rickettsial Zoonosis Branch in Atlanta. Um, also worked with ADB a little bit um, at the CDC, and then my funding comes from ORISE, and my initial funding came from ASM. And then we had a ton of help from collaborators in Minnesota, so I had a chance to work with um, folks from public health departments, the Minnesota State Health Department, um, U.S. Forest Service, Minnesota DNR, um, Camp Ripley, um, smaller universities, univers um, Winona, or St. Mary State in Winona. Um, so a big thank you because it was a big project and it was a lot of collaboration and a lot of help. So um, I'd just like to spend the next few minutes, I guess, um, looking at research plans um, for um, here in Texas. And so I would say broadly my research um, will focus on the spatial distribution of vectors and pathogens causing um, disease in wildlife and livestock and looking at that kind of interface. and. I haven't quite figured out Texas geography yet, so I don't know if Uvalde is southwest or west or south or so. The whole thing on here is south slash west, so I don't know. I don't know yet, um, but I'm really interested in vector and pathogen emergence and persistence, um, the role of invasive, and I know you guys have a lot of exotic species here in Texas, um, so I'm, I'm interested in their roles. Um, in, in kind of moving ticks around and, and pathogens potentially. Um, I'm also interested in the impact of climate change uh, on these distributions. And I think my ultimate goal of research would be to um, kind of develop an effective, um, or basically the outcome of my research would be to uh, identify effective uh, management strategies to reduce risk uh, to wildlife and disease populations as well. Um, so uh, a few research areas um, in no particular order. Um, first, I think you can all agree that cattle fever is an issue in Texas and it has been for a long time. Um, the, the treatments um, for a long time remained the same. So in the 20s, they would go through these dipping stations, which were a lot more dirty than they are now. Uh, so this is a more modern dipper, di dipping station. Um, but cattle are not the only problem now. And so, um, so we need to figure out different ways to treat other, um, other individuals, as well as um, pesticide re or, um, resistance, uh, acaricide resistance um, developing in these animals. So um, again, I don't need to tell any of you that cattle fever has a very long research or long history. Um, there's been a ton of research that's been conducted on it, um, and yet the problem, it, it remains, it persists. And so, um, and this is, I'm assuming, likely to a lot of reintroductions from Mexico and a lot of movement of wildlife that we have less control over um, than, um, than cattle. Um, obviously, um, USDA knows this is a big problem. Um, they have the National Cattle Tick um, Eradication Program and they still use tick riders to patrol the border and look for stray cattle and take them in and scratch them for ticks and treat them. Um, and so, again, it's just, it's a real rich history of research here. Um, but I think what's, what's coming to light now is that there's a, a needed 
a need for an improved understanding of wildlife um, livestock interactions and um, you know, I think there's differing ecology between the white tailed deer and the Nilgai antelope, and this needs to be um, taken into account. And I'm also interested in an improved understanding of the distributions and contributions of Ripocephalus annulatus um, and um, Babesia begemini um, to the system. You, you most often hear about Bovis and Microplus, um, but these two species do overlap um, in, in part of their distribution. And so I'm kind of understanding, or I'm interested in understanding what's happening in these in this overlapping zone. Um, and then, of course, there's always um, the the question or the problem of insecticide resistance. Um, so just briefly, just kind of. Um, to give you an idea of how, how I look at stuff and um, how I begin to approach a system that I really don't have a lot of data on or a lot of knowledge about, I should say. Um, so I kind of look for patterns. Um, and so here we have cattle in, or infestations um, in 2017, current infestations. And I'm sure lots of you have seen this map. So we have lots of introductions um, on this western border. And then down by Brownsville, it's, it's a huge problem as well. Um, but what we can see, if you look at land cover, that these areas have, have much different land cover. So to me, this is saying something different is happening in this area, or potentially is happening in this area um, versus this area. Perhaps the introductions aren't coming from the same place. And in fact, the more <laughs> research I did, um, I, I saw that this has, has been shown. And um, it looks like the Nilgai antelope are, are really able to move across this more cropland, agricultural um, landscape, and are responsible for a lot of introductions um, in, in this area of South Texas. However, if we look at, um, so sorry, I should have uh, mentioned that the red, um, the red squares are Nilgai um, introductions, uh, and the yellows are cattle, and the greens um, are, are white-tailed deer introductions. Um, so again, we see lots of Nilgai introduction down here, and in a different landscape, more bushland, um, we see uh, more white-tailed deer introductions. So again, this just goes to show that um, I think we need to consider, you know, depending on where you're looking in the system, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to, um, to management, and I think you have to consider the different species that um, are there as well. Um, if we look at ticks, um, so this was uh, some research that was published a few years ago looking at the um, potential of invasion um, for the uh, cattle fever ticks. And so we have two um, species of ticks. Again, this is the annulatus population, and then this is the microplus population. Again, we see a little bit of overlap here. And so these guys used, um, I think, Max and Garp um, spatial or ecological niche modeling um, to estimate the current distributions and then the distributions in 2050. And so if we look first at, oh, my Micropolis disappeared somehow. So this is Micropolis. Um, this is the historic distribution. Um, the present distribution, again, showing um, just this kind of tip of Texas. And then um, in 2050, the, the um, predicted distribution um, really, really constricts. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if this actually happens. But, um, but then if we look at its annulatus um, and its, um, dis its uh, historic distribution, its present distribution, again, it cuts off right about where Micropolis starts. Um, and then if we looked at its predicted distribution in 2050, um, it's predicted to cover a whole lot of Texas. So I think my interest here is, is it really playing a role in, in cattle fever? And if so, should we get ahead of that and understand it before we're playing catch up, um, perhaps? So I'm really interested in, in again, uh, right now, that transitional zone or that kind of crossover zone where both species are present in the system. Uh, another area of research that I'm really interested in, and again, I don't have to tell you guys about the problem with feral swine in Texas, um, but I am interested in feral swine and the interactions between wildlife and, and these swine populations. Um, again, kind of like uh, cattle fever, I see this as an ongoing problem. Um, I, I kind of understand that there are 
different approaches to management of pigs, um, depending on um, the land landowner. Um, some people want pigs, some people don't want pigs. Um, but I'm really interested in, in using them as a mechanism to understand um, other things. And so there's been um, a lot of research um, done in, in other areas showing that, in fact, um, wild pigs can have uh, an impact on um, moving ticks or um, uh, ectoparasites around, as well as um, moving pathogens around. So I'm really interested in um, kind of a better understanding of these contact rates between um, wildlife, pig, and um, domestic uh, livestock, because I think even though I guess I would say that feral swine are wildlife, maybe, um, but they're interacting with the actual wildlife that are out there as well. And so there's kind of this three-way interaction, I would argue. Um, so I'm interested in their contribution to vector dispersal, pathogen dispersal, and potentially using them as, as a kind of a sentinel species for the presence of these other pathogens. So finally, um, this is basically just kind of a general slide of, um, of research interests. So I would like to um, establish productive co collaborations with, with you all in the room um, um, across, uh, across the university system uh, and work with you all to uh, identify um, strategic priorities surrounding conservation and management and try to work with you all to identify systems of top concern um, and, and kind of be a, uh, an assistant, uh, if you will, or a collaborator um, on projects. Um, so additional systems that I have interested in um, are anaplasma and Chagas disease, uh, pseudorabies, chronic wasting disease, white nose syndrome, um, West Nile virus, AI, um, I did quite a bit of work in plague. I know plague's probably not a big issue in this part of Texas, um, but there are reports of plague. Um, so, and then um, also uh, Texas is on the southwest leading edge of um, Ixodes scapularis, as well as um, being within the distribution or potential distribution of both species of Aedes that transmit Zika and um, I know that the CDC, I'm going to put on my public health hat for a second, the CDC um, just uh, recently gave out funding to establish um, centers of excellence. Um, there are five centers across the U.S. Um, and there is a center in Texas. I'm not exactly sure if it went to UTMB or if it's collaboration with a and I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I know that A&M is, is involved with it. And one of the big... Um, that big pushes for these centers of excellence was to increase um, surveillance and, and capacity across states. And I know Uvalde is kind of out there. Um, so if I can assist and put on my One Health hat and um, assist with um, anything um, contributing to research for um, public health, uh, I would be willing to uh, enter into those um, collaborations as well. So I would say that the goal of the research program that I would like to develop um, would focus on prevention in addition to control and surveillance um, and try to utilize new tools to understand dispersal and establishment um, and inform integrated management strategy strategies. Um, I think population genetics and landscape genetics are genetics don't lie, genes don't lie, so I think they're a very good tool. Um, to try to use and get a better handle on uh, movement um, patterns, things that inhibit movement, things that encourage movement, um, those types of things. And then again, realizing that management schemes may differ across regions and that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to, to management. I don't, you know, certainly, we were talking to Don Davis last night and talking about chronic wasting and, you know, he said, you know, you can't apply everything that you did in Montana or Colorado and bring it to Texas and expect it to work the same way. And I'm, I'm truly aware of that, and I, and I think that that's a, big, that's a big issue that people try to implement management in areas that it may not work um, the same as it was originally designed to work in. Um, so again, just to follow up, um, to create an integrated research program building on existing research um, and um, collaborations, as well as establishing new ones. Um, I hope to establish an externally funded research program um, and to provide a strong research, research environment for undergrads as well as graduate students. 
I think starting at the undergrad level and becoming involved at that level is very beneficial. Um, I never had that opportunity and I can see how it would help you out a lot to figure out what it is that you want to do. Um, and then um, I would like to engage external partners. Um, I, I've been in contact with the USDA AFIS and ARS. Um, previous to coming down here, there's a large presence of USDA folks um, in Fort Collins. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, and then also looking or reaching out to the Texas um, Animal Health Commission. Um, I'm looking forward to working with the East Foundation, potentially the National Park Service. I have contacts with them as well. Um, there's some um, tick-borne disease research um, grants that are out there. Um, I think they're kind of ultimately through DOD. Um, and then funding from NSF and EEID as well. Um, and then I, I understand that engagement from Mexican universities when trying to study cattle fever is kind of lacking and that there's not a very good understanding of what's happening right on the other side of the border. I also realize that that might not be the safest place to conduct research. I don't know that that's true, but I've been told that. Um, so I don't know how much probability or possibility there is of, of engaging um, universities in Mexico to help with the tick-borne research on, on their side of the border. So um, this is my last slide. Um, I'm Again, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is a metaphor for several things, including Texas and <laughs> the part that I would be working in and the rest of the state. Um, but I think there are many exciting, um, exciting avenues for um, research collaborations um, here in Texas um, at the university, but at the state level as well. Um, I think that Texas offers a unique opportunity to study the role of invasives and exotics. Um, and this area of Texas also offers a great opportunity to study the potential of introduction or reintroductions of, of pathogens and vectors from, from Mexico as well. And with the position in Uvalde, I would hope to increase the research capacity in that area of Texas. So with that, I thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions. It was all drag sampling. Okay. Um, and then sort of a related question, when you were looking at pathogen prevalence in small mammals, so the work that's still ongoing uh -huh. waiting for PCR results, to, I have a variety of questions for that, that study. Did you mark recapture those small mammals so that you would know if you were catching them again to track prevalence over time? So it was a snapshot. We trapped okay. each one of those sites for two consecutive days and nights. Um, and then, but I mean, we did recapture some animals, but we had clipped their ears so you could tell. Okay. And so we didn't reprocess or, or redraw blood from those animals. So it was just a snapshot. Okay, so that tissue then that you were taking was ear? Ear tissue, tissue. yes. Okay. Yep. And did you simultaneously drag sample at the same time, or the focus was just on the small mammals? Nope, so, so, um, so we, when we showed up to a site, we, we, we set up our grid, and then we drug the grid for ticks and then set the traps. And then we, two days later, we pulled the traps and then we dra dragged, sampled the grid again. Okay. And then we went back in tw the next year and we drag sampled each of those again okay. to calculate density. Um, and then we also, we did extra sampling if we didn't get up to 50 ticks just to kind of be more sure in our, our prevalence estimates. Um, but those weren't counted in the densities. Did, when you were examining the small mammals, did you take ticks from them and do you plan on testing those ticks for infection prevalence as well? So I removed every tick from every animal and um, we are not at this point planning to test, um, mostly because the ticks are at all stages of engorgement. Um, and we are testing the, the small mammals for, for our seven pathogens. Um, and I'm just not sure how much you would gain from testing those ticks. So at this point, we have a big backlog of samples, which is why our PCR is just getting done on the small mammals. But um, yeah, there, as of this point, there is no plan to test those ticks. Yes? The, uh, the synchronous uh, questing of the, the life stages of the ticks, 
Has that been documented elsewhere other than Minnesota? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Maybe a little bit in Illinois, but I don't, and it's to a lesser extent in Michigan, but it's very prominent, it's very, very well overlapping in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So is there any hypothesis as to why you're seeing it in the Great Lakes states where it's not really seen it elsewhere? Uh, the pathogens or the questing? The questing. Yeah, it's all environmental. Yep, there's just, there's less time to do things in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, nope. Um, that's certainly possible. Um, we only focus on Exodia scapularis, um, which is the only thing east of the Mississippi that can transmit Lyme disease um, and all of these other crazy things. Um, but I don't know the phenology of like Pacificus in California very well, um, so I'm not sure. But there's definitely talk about that the synchronous questing could. You know, it certainly could increase co-infections, and it could increase just in pathogen and in, in, prevalence in general because you you have kind of have double the chance to infect yourself essentially. So even if you have a larvae that may have something that's transalvarial transmitted, like perhaps Miyamotoi, and you have a nymphal tick that doesn't isn't infected with Miyamotoi, and that larvae feeds on that mouse at the same time the uninfected nymph is then that nymph has the option to pick up something that it was transverely transmitted. So, yeah, I think that's why we see a lot of co-infections there and four pathogens and one tick. Yeah, careful if you go to Minnesota. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Sorry. You're fine. <laughs> For the cattle fever work and the invasive potential of those ticks, so you're modeling, right? Um, which means you need some sort of baseline data of current distribution of those ticks. Where are those data coming from? So um, I'm not positive, but I do know that the two sets of ticks um, that I showed for the climate modeling, and then there's another one that's looking at um, genetic diversity and mixing of tick populations. Um, and Dave Wagner out of NIU has that data, but I don't know where he got it. Um, so yeah, it, again, it's one of those things that I, I don't know a whole lot of resources at this point and don't have any set, set plans, um, but I would hope to kind of gain that information coming here and talking to people. Yeah. So with regard to working on cattle fever ticks, you've discussed, you know, you've got the system, you've got all these sites, there's clearly something else other than land cover going on. Can you imagine any interdisciplinary collaborations because you are dealing with a, a human system as well as far as livestock management sure. that would help you answer those kinds of questions? I mean, I think dealing with the land managers is essential. I mean, they know what's happening on their land. Um, and I don't, I mean, again, it's one of those situations where I don't know about all of the resources quite yet. Um, I know that there are extension centers and there are institutes kind of all over, and um, it seems most likely that I would collaborate with A&M people that are kind of dispersed all over. Um, again, I, I don't know exactly how that would work, um, but I definitely, I mean, to come at these systems from, from multiple angles, I think is most beneficial, and you know, talking to the people that work the land every day and that are out there and that see nil guy come across every day or haven't ever seen a nil guy come across their property. Um, yeah, so as far as specifics, I, I don't know yet because it's just such a vast, vast organization, I would say. Sure, sure, so a follow-up question on that then. I noticed a lot of your research in times past has been on public lands or various governmental agency lands. So what's your experience with, with private lands and then the, the add-on to that when you are working with a reportable disease, such as Texas cattle fever, you, you discover it on a piece of property, that property is not quarantined. Right. Um, what's your philosophy as far as landowner relations with these kind of sensitive issues? Sure, so um, luckily, I will tell you, I'm from Wyoming and I grew up on a ranch, so that helps. Um, my experience in Minnesota, all of my, my tick experience really has been um, on on public land, like you said. There's a lot of public land in Minnesota. There's a lot of public land in Montana. Um, there's a lot of public land in Wyoming, but 
when I was studying prairie dogs, so I studied prairie dogs in Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico. Oh, in Kansas. Um, so all these grasslands, and although there's a lot of public land out there, there's a lot of public land that you can't get to without crossing private land. And so I am a firm believer in you, A, you never go on somebody's property without their permission. B, you always close every gate that you go through that you open. Um, and I would go to these ranchers' houses, and I had colleagues that got kicked off, like got ran off ranches before, and like, watch out when you go to ranches in Oklahoma because like they'll bring out their guns and be like, hey. And I talked to so many ranchers over those six years that I studied prairie dogs, and I guarantee that's the only reason I was successful, is because I could relate to them. I mean, I grew up shooting prairie dogs, and that's what they do, too. And so I had to convince them, you know, like, this is really what, what I'm out here doing, and this is what I'm studying, you know. And I, I think just my background and the ability to relate to them and know, you know, that that's their livelihood. And um, certainly it'll be different down here, especially with the game ranches. I have, um, you know, I've, I'm assuming that there are lots of different opinions from the different types of game ranches, whether it's conservation or hunting, um, and as well as the ranchers, whether they're, you know, 10,000 acre operations or 2,000 acre operations. Um, so, yeah, that's. I mean, I just, I, I know that public or private landholder investment and knowledge and, you know, just transparency, like what are you doing on my land and why are you doing it? Um, so just constant communication, I would say, with landowners would be my